welcome. Uh, this is the final session of the Soil and Nutrition Conference, the 10th annual for 2021. We've been going for eight months and this is the final session and we're super excited. We know we have a lot of new folks joining us today. Um, at last count, we had over 600, close to 700 people. So um, my only wish is that I could see everybody's faces and you know we could all be in community here together, but I'm really grateful for all of you um, who decided to join us. So thank you and welcome. Um, first, just a couple of housekeeping things. I'm Lisa Stokey, first of all. I'm gonna be your moderator today. Dan Kittredge, who's the founder and executive director of Bionutrient Food Association and the newly launched Bionutrient Institute. He's gonna be your host. And we have a really amazing lineup of people. We're all so excited um, to be sharing this with you. The session today, as you all are probably aware, but it's defining nutrient density in beef. And we're gonna have a really, I think, really riveting conversation about this today. I know a lot of you here are already very interested in that and that's why you're here. So the couple of housekeeping things are that, um, so we're gonna save a, about, I think 40 minutes at the end of our session for a Q&A. This session is an hour and a half. We're gonna hear presentations from Dan, from Dr. Fred Provenza, Dr. Stefan Van Vliet, Nicole Masters, and then we have a special message from Joel Salatin also. So, um, and Stefan, while his session is recorded because he's on a flight right now, he's gonna be joining us shortly. So even though you're gonna be hearing a recording from him, he'll be able to answer your questions. So when you have those questions come up from each speaker, I'm just gonna ask you to put them in the Q&A. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat where you can talk with other members. And I see a lot of you are already engaging there already, which is fantastic. Um, and at the end, I'll be moderating the questions. So if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A as we go along. And then at the end, we'll get to those. Um, so with no further ado then, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. And Dan, I'm gonna ask you, since we do have a lot of new folks joining us today, I think, I'm gonna ask you to just provide a brief intro about the BFA, the Institute, and then especially about this project, the study. This is the, the first time that, that we've done this to attempt to you know, give a window into defining nutrient density. So it's really exciting. And um, so take it away. Great, thank you, Lisa, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, this is quite a quite a turnout we have here. I'm watching the chat, people from all over the world um, sharing their uh, introductions to each other. Or it looks like some people know each other already. That's wonderful. Um, my name is Dan Kittredge. I'm the the founder and executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association. Um, we're a ten year old organization whose mission is increasing quality in the food supply. And by quality, we mean flavor, aroma nutritive value, health giving attribute. Um, we've helped popularize the term nutrient density to refer to that. Um, and we've been working for the last five years in partnership with a couple you know, uh, key organizations, um, certainly certainly RSI and Open Team, uh, PharmaOS, Next7, there's been a, a bunch of other organizations, uh, farming organizations and companies and universities that have been collaborating. Uh, I mean, we're working on a sort of a, what I call it is a three-legged stool. One is to define the variation in nutrient levels in food. Um, so characterize in antioxidants in spinach, what is the what is the range in copper, in cucumbers, in you know, sulfur, in uh, potatoes. There is a, a quite significant level of you know nutrient variation within food, uh, which is not recorded on labels. And so to define nutrient density, we have to first identify, you know, what's the high and low in each of these in each of these nutrients. And so, we've been working um, now with uh, our main lab in Michigan, um, secondary lab in at Chico State, a third lab in France, um, an engineering lab in Boston, um, to capture this kind of data for the last four or five years. We've done 25, 21 crops now, and shown you know categorical variation uh, within nutrients both elements and secondary metabolites we've been able to assess. Some people may be familiar with that work. Um, so one piece, one leg of the stool is defining variation. 
Uh, the second leg of the stool is the instrumentation to test nutrient levels. So building the handheld spectrometer that can be used to go and literally flash a light at the carrot, or in this case, beef, and get a reading back um, so that we don't necessarily need to trust labels or marketing or um, you I mean, you can, but you also have an empirical assessment um, mechanism to accomplish that ability to discern relatively what's better or what's worse. And so we've uh, built and now are shipping our second generation meters, uh, which are calibrated to um, 10 for 10 different crops. And so we've, you know, proof of concept shown that we can build a handheld open source consumer priced spectrometer and, um, and, you know, manufacture and distribute it. Uh, the third leg of the stool is the connection between um, management and environmental conditions and those nutrient variations. And so um, in 2019, we worked with about 35 farms to document all of their environmental conditions, not all of them, but a number of them and management practices. And then when the farms sent in their crops to the lab for assessment, we also asked them to send in their soil. And so we got the top top four inches and the next four inches. Um, and so we could overlay from a data perspective, the management practices and environmental conditions against the soil metrics, against the nutrient variations in the crops. Um, in 2020, we uh, worked about 150 farms across North America and Europe to uh, engage that process. And, you know, um, we're not surprised, but are, you know, happy to say we have found direct connections between management practices that would be otherwise understood to be regenerative or biological or organic or whatever the terms are you want to use, positive connections between those management practices, increased levels in soil carbon and increased levels in soil in crop nutrients. So direct connection between soil management and nutrient levels. Um, it's been our hypothesis that those things are connected, but to actually show it in the data has been quite an accomplishment. So. As of this year, we feel like we've we've accomplished our basic proof of concept. You know, is it possible to define nutrient variations in crops? Yes. Is it possible to build instruments that can test that by a you know a consumer at a relatively low price point? Yes. Is it possible to connect those nutrient variations to management practices so we can support growers in focusing on the dynamics that would correlate with increased nutrient levels? Yes. Um, and so now we're at this next phase where we feel like we've been able to show what's that it's possible to engage the strategy. Um, and the real strategy is to use economic incentive, you know, self interest for the consumer says, these carrots taste better. Um, they're more likely to have more nutrients, my kids are more likely to eat them, they're more likely to make me healthier. I'm going to choose those over the ones that are next to them on the shelf of a different label or brand. Um, you know, use that economic incentive to support the supply chain and focusing on nutrition as an objective as opposed to volume and aesthetic. Um, and our understanding then is that that will not only correlate with um, increased human health effects, but also environmental health effects. So uh, that's the broader objective of our, of our work um, is to use nutrient density as a, a market force to support the things that many of us here probably understand to be solutions. Um, so now that we've shown that the, in concept it can be done, we're stepping into a proper definition of something, uh, of nutrient density on something. We've identified variation, but we have not identified nutrient density. Um, we understand that nutrient density is a complex, you know, web of relationships between families of compounds, whether it's the lipids or the proteins or the carbohydrates or the secondary metabolites and the minerals, all these things in certain levels and ratios, you know, are what we would say is better or worse, but teasing out those levels and ratios is actually a complex endeavor. And so um, we're starting with beef and this is our formal public announcement, um, you know, explanation, welcoming of the community to that process. Uh, we're very excited by the, um, by the interest, uh, by the attendance here, um, very honored by the, um, presenters who are, who are joining to share their insight. Um, so I'm just really grateful for all of the work um, that has gone on thus far, all the, the, the grower partners and the citizen scientists and the partner organizations and the, and the organizational members. Um, we do all this work in the open source, uh, in the commons, and um, 
you know, my name is associated with it, but there's many, many, many people who are who have put their shoulder to the wheel and have assisted in this process thus far. So uh, grateful for all that and looking forward to the next steps. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I think we're all looking forward to the next steps. <laughs> um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Fred Provenza. And as he gets his camera on here, I'm just going to give him, hi, Fred. Hi, how Thank are you? Thank so you much for joining us. Good to see you, Lisa and Dan. Great well. to see you too. If I may, I'd like to offer just a brief introduction for you. Uh, Fred is a professor emeritus of behavioral psychology in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University, where he directed an award-winning research group that pioneered an understanding of how learning influence, influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soil and plants with herbivores and humans. Fred is one of the founders of BEHAVE. That's an acronym, an international network of scientists and land managers committed to integrating behavioral principles with local knowledge to enhance environmental, economic, and cultural values of rural and urban communities. His latest book, Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Natural Wisdom, is probably something that a lot of you have read. And I actually don't even know if that's your latest book. I'm assuming it is. I read, I read. <laughs> it is, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and, and I have to add one more thing before um, I give you the floor. Um, this is kind of a fun thing. So yesterday, um, Dan and I talked with his father, Jack Kittredge, who's the editor of The Natural Farmer for uh, NOFA in the Northeast. And I remember him reading your book a few years ago. And so I was asking Jack, I said, you know, do you have some things you'd like to say about this? And um, I don't know if you know Jack, but this was quite the compliment. And one thing he said, he said many things, but one thing he said that I can share is that he said, there cannot be enough superlatives for Fred. So with further ado, um, thank you, Fred, for joining us. Well, thank you, Lisa and Dan. And uh, it's wonderful to, to be here, honestly, with you. I'll, uh, I, I see as my, my role, in this is to try to set the stage for, for what, uh, what others will, will be saying. And so I put together some slides and uh, I'll run through them. I'm gonna stick to the 10 minutes that I, that I was allotted. But it's, uh, to me, it's about how pallets link animals with landscapes. And uh, you know these linkages that we're all quite familiar with for sure. I want to emphasize plant diversity as part of what I'll, I'll say here today, and you'll see why as we go. I'll also touch on three topics, um, animal welfare, human health, and climate and environment. I won't, um, I'll touch on those as I, as I go along. Uh, Dan, I, I really appreciated all that you were saying, the work that you've been doing, and, and I think about the many, many years of work by ecologists looking at how resource availability, sunlight, nutrients, and water influences the phytochemical characteristics of plants, the environment where they're growing. And I see the work that you're describing very much aligned with that work of ecologists. And then we'll take that to say, so that influences plant diversity and chemistry in the environment. And then point I wanna to make today is that influences the health of herbivores. For me, I think uh, work from many, many years, whether it's wildlife ecology or range or whatever it is, is summarized in this right here, this idea that plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, habitat that is, grocery stores and pharmacies for creatures below and above ground. I think that to me that just summarizes the, the whole works of it. And I think nothing is more important for health through nutrition than landscapes with a variety of plants. And that's for creatures below ground and above ground as well. Um, so how does that affect animals? I, I wanna talk about this notion of self-medication and say that there's two ways that animals can do that. One, a sick animal can self-medicate therapeutically, but I think even more importantly is this notion of prophylaxis. So from a therapeutic standpoint, 
we know in, in wild and domestic animals from insects to primates to human beings that animals can learn to self-medicate. We showed that in many, many different studies over the years, um, everything from tannins in plants like sandfoin and bird's foot trefoil that can help animals to self-medicate for bloat on plants like alfalfa, for instance. In feedlots, we were looking at, at sodium bicarb and bentonite as ways that animals can, can self-medicate for acidosis. And I'm making a point of that, and I put nausea there because I'm going to return to that in just a minute. And on and on and on, uh, down through to plants where animals can use uh, to medicate for external parasites as well as internal parasites. So we know that animals can use nature's pharmacy as a way to, to help themselves when they're sick. But beyond that is this whole notion of prophylaxis. And you know, for folks like me and wildlife ecologists 50 years ago, we were really interested in trying to understand dietary habits of animals. Just what do they eat? Go out there and follow them around. And what we all found was that, you know, three to five plants will make up the bulk of the diet of the meat of any one meal. But if you follow animals throughout the day, they'll eat 50 to 75 or more plants if they're available to them. Well, back in those days, we focused on the three to five because we thought that's what's really leading to production by animals. But the more we've gone along, I think it's the 50 to 75 that are just as important. And uh, Dan, you mentioned the secondary compounds or phytochemicals, whatever we wanna call them. I think through their many, many properties, these plants eaten in small amounts, uh, you know, they're antimicrobial, antiparasitic, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, they boost immune function. Um, so they bolster health and protect animals against diseases and pathogens. And by being able to nibble their way through a variety of grasses, forbs, and shrubs, um, animals are able to benefit from those, those, that diversity of plants. That's why now researchers really in countries around the globe are showing that health improves when livestock graze diverse mixtures of plants compared to putting them on a monoculture. They gain weight more efficiently with less emissions of greenhouse gases, which is important, and they can reach slaughter weight quick, as quickly as animals in feedlots. So I'm summarizing a lot of work that's coming out nowadays, but that's the, that's the highlights of what people are finding. You know, livestock producers are also finding that morbidity and mortality decrease when animals have a diverse array of different plants to select from. Um, this helps to explain too, this notion of diversity, why plants that are thought to be quite unpalatable, for instance, Ceresia lespedisa, which is very high in tannins, or endophyte infected tall fescue, which is very high in alkaloids, when animals have access to both those foods, there's what we refer to as a complementarity. The tannins in Ceresia bind the alkaloids in tall fescue, which enables animals to eat more of Ceresia and tall fescue. One producer told me many years ago that he put four daughters through college on what people would consider to be, quote, the mix of plants from hell. Well, we've shown in, in studies that we've done that um, complementarities and sequences as well are really important. Animals can learn that, for instance, an appetizer of bird foot trefoil helps them to eat much more tall fescue. Again, the tannin alkaloid kind of relationship. From a rangeland standpoint, those same kind of things hold for, for bitter brush and sagebrush. So this whole notion of complementarities becomes very important. And that's the basis for, for what the French shepherds do, moving animals around landscapes. And that's what Glenn Elzing is doing out here in the West in ways that they can utilize all the different plants in the community through appetizers, main courses, booster stages, desserts, and so forth. So they can stimulate appetite and intake. They can utilize a variety of, of different plants, including target grazing weeds. And really important, it enables individuals to regulate their intake of these primary and secondary compounds. 
If you realize that, and we did this over and over again, no two individuals are alike in their needs for nutrients or medicines. We know that each one of us is so unique, we can be identified by our fingerprint, bloodhound can track us by our odors. If you look internally at organ systems, how they're built and how they function, every individual is unique. So self-selection enables individuals to more efficiently meet their needs for nutrients and medicines as we showed with goat, sheep and cattle, all three. The, so that raises issues then with feedlots and not to go too far down this for sake of time, but you know, nutritionists formulate so-called total mixed rations for animals in feedlots, and it's for the average animal in a group, but there is no average animal. The monotony of total mixed rations leads to stress. Grain, I mentioned nausea earlier. Grain creates food aversions, high levels of grain, which leads to diseases like metabolic syndrome that these animals ex experience. And so we come to rely on antibiotics, which has its own issues. Um, without dwelling on any of this, animal welfare is an issue nowadays for good reasons. And all of those issues I'm raising uh, are in violation of these five freedoms of animals. So the last points then that I wanna do to, to help set up Stefan as he's coming along is to build from this idea of the importance of plant diversity and chemistry for, for wild domestic animals above and below ground to this notion that that influences the biochemical richness of the diets of animals, which is influencing the quality of milk, cheese, and meat, we think. Um, there's evidence for that, certainly. And I think one of the neat studies from many years ago was dairy cows allowed to do forage on really diverse swords or fed a total mixed ration. And what they did was to, to show that the phytochemical and biochemical richness was much, much greater when animals foraged on diverse pastures. The flavors of the milk and cheese were much better and local people greatly preferred <clears throat> the milk and cheese coming from these diverse pastures. We know that the flavor of meat is influenced by the phytochemical richness of the diet. Yet we know very little actually about how different mixtures of plants affect meat flavor, quality, satiety when a human eats it and human health. So we're very interested in this. Um, one of the, the only study I know about on the globe that looks at, at inflammation, you, you might or might not know that anytime we eat a meal, there's an inflammatory response in our body. And uh, the foods we eat are influencing that. Well, this study showed that when people ate meat from kangaroos foraging on diverse pastures, there was virtually no inflammatory response compared with, with cattle grazing, uh, being fed total mixed rations in feedlots. So low-grade systemic inflammation leads to diseases, especially when, when meal after meal after meal causes inflammation. Um, some foods we know are pro-inflammatory, others are anti-inflammatory. We know that phytochemically rich herbs and spices are anti-inflammatory. Um, we know that Native Americans used anti-inflammatory kinds of berries and herbs to, as part of uh, meat, pemmican, for instance. It's also a study that's just out that shows that <clears throat> when Eating traditionally processed meat is not associated with increased risk of cancer in Morocco. It's because of the way that they process the meat using various herbs and spices. And so that leads to Stefan and to the points that what we're really interested in then is comparing uh, baked meat with meat from feedlots, with meats from eating animals eating phytochemically rich diets. And Stefan will talk about the metabolomic analyses that we're doing, some of the feeding trials that we want to get into, looking at inflammatory responses, and the clinical trials then, the larger clinical trials down the road. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you as part of this uh, great effort that you're doing. Wonderful. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much for that. I know that um, you could probably share enough with us to go on for hours, if not days. So <laughs> I really appreciate your effort at um, being very succinct with us today. And that was a lot of really great information. Um, I know that you and Stefan work very closely together. 
Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, yeah, we'll let Stefan take it from here and, and get into to some of the kind of work that we're doing. So thank you again for the opportunity. You bet, thank you so much. All right, next up, I'm going to um, introduce Stefan. Steph, as I said, Stefan is on a flight right now and he's gonna be joining us any moment. So if you have any questions for him, you can put those in the Q&A. Um, for those of you, so many of you may be actually familiar with Stefan's work. I have been seeing him on podcasts, especially in the grass-fed and regenerative community. He is a nutrition scientist and metabolomics expert in the Stedman Nutrition and Metabolism Center at Duke University. He earned his PhD in kinesiology as an ESPEN fellow from the University of Illinois at Urban Champaign and received training at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. In January of 22, uh, it is 2022, Dr. Van Vliet will start his position at the Center for Human Nutrition Studies at Utah State University. Dr. Van Vliet's research is performed at the nexus of agriculture and human health. He routinely collaborates with farmers, ecologists, and agricultural scientists to study critical linkages between agricultural production methods the nutrient density of food and human health. Dr. Van Vliet uses metabolomics and proteomics, pardon my pronunciation, techniques to study the presence of bioactive compounds in foods and their impacts on human metabolic health. His work has been published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, Scientific Reports, the Journal of Nutrition, and the Journal of Physiology. So Stefan is going to join us again with a recording right now, and he's going to speak to us really about the, um, you know, the deeper aspects of the study. He designed this study with us, and we're really looking forward to collaborating with him. So I'll let you um, play that as you're ready. Chris, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, attending today's webinar about the Beef Nutrient Density Project. My name is Dr. Stefan van Vliet. I am a nutrition scientist within the Duke University School of Medicine, but I'll be starting a position next year at Utah State University within the Center for Human Nutrition Studies as part of the College of Agriculture. And this is really where uh, my main interest is in linking the fields of agriculture and human health. Now, in my research group, we perform research at the nexus of agriculture and human health, and we ask questions that relate to things such as, do agricultural production practices that can potentially benefit soil health, uh, plant diversity and plant health, and animal health also benefit human health, and really doing systems type of research where we link that all together. Now, in our work, we routinely work with farmers, ecologists, livestock scientists, as well as extension folks to really uh, get the information out into the community. We're in, within this project, we'll be connecting the health of soils, plants, animals, and humans, and really looking at metrics uh, of soil health, plant health, animal health, and human health, and nutrient transfer along this continuum. As part of this project, we asked farmers to send in a variety of samples, starting with soil samples. Within the soil, we'll be measuring things such as uh, total carbon, we're measuring respiration, minerals, pH, as well as extractable minerals and available nitrogen. In other words, we'll uh, study various parameters of soil health. We also asked to send uh, samples of, of the forage and feed that animals have consumed. We'll do a standard uh, forage analysis and also for the total minerals. And in the future, we also aim to look at some of the phenolic compounds in the forage and the feed and see how that differs. Uh, and this can be both pasture samples as well as total mixed ration samples and really everything in between and from various geographical locations and various production systems to really look at, at the broad spectrum of uh, the nutrients or the feed that animals are fed and how does that relate to the nutrient density of the meat. We also ask uh, farmers to send in uh, fecal samples from the cattle. We wanna study the health of the gut microbiome. We'll be looking at markers such as alpha and beta diversity, which are associated with gut health and anti-inflammatory pathways. We'll also look at various gut bacterial species 
and, and see how uh, the feed or the forage that the animals consumes impacts the gut microbial health of the animal and how uh, that relates to particularly the, the nutrient density of, of the meat as well as animal health metrics. Now meat samples, we'll ask uh, farmers to, to send, in, send in those as well. And here is really where a lot of my expertise will also come in, uh, looking at the research workflow of, of metabolomics. Now, starting at, uh, at, with, uh, at the, the left upper hand corner, we'll start with meat samples. We'll process those in our wide lab facilities. We will run them through a mass spec and we'll probe about 170 70 different metabolites. Within that, we'll be determining a nutrient density of, of the beef sources, um, such as fatty acids, phenolic compounds, and then we'll link that back to uh, soil health and forest quality and management to really link all these, uh, these uh, metrics together that we'll get as part of this project. And with it, using metabolomics approaches, we go much beyond just protein and fatty acids. Most prior research has myopically focused on, on protein content as well as the fatty acid content, such as the omega-3s and conjugated linoleic acid. Now, while that is certainly important, foods contain uh, hundreds to thousands of compounds that can impact human health and metabolism particularly fatty acids, bioactive peptides, and phytochemicals. Now, our initial pilot work suggests that especially uh, the, within the phytochemicals, there's a transfer of the phytochemicals from phytochemically rich forage into the meat, and, and meat will then concentrate more phytochemicals that could have potentially anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects uh, for the consumer. So we're comparing the beef metabolome and uh, in future work, trying to relate that to the human metabolome, as well as the nutrigenome. The nutrigenome is really related to disease-related gene expression. So how do the metabolites or the phytochemicals that appear in beef impact human metabolism? And how do they impact disease-related gene expression? Because there's large-scale concerns about the effects of red meat on diseases such as cancer, heart disease, uh, as in even obesity and diabetes. Now, so we will look at how these phytochemicals within the meat will impact potentially disease-related gene expression. The potential health-promoting metabolites in meat that we'll be probing is about 200 metabolites over eight nutrient classes. Many of these metabolites have potentially anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, brain protective, or even antiviral effects. We know this mostly from in vitro work, but it's important to study these compounds in meat and to evaluate these in future human nutrition trials. These are things such as omega-3 fatty acids, which most of you are uh, familiar with, particularly EPA and DHA, the omega-3 fatty acids, as well as the omega-3 to 6 ratio, which can be heavily influenced by the forage or feed that the animal consumes. Now, in more recent times, we've also uh, started to investigate phytochemicals. Now, what are phytochemicals? Phytochemicals are secondary metabolites produced by the plant. What is particularly unique is that the animal consumes vegetation that you and I cannot consume and upcycles various of these phytochemicals from the forage directly into the meat, as well as uh, in the milk. But for this project, we're focused on meat. These are things such as uh, phenolic acids, flavonoids, alkaloids, uh, benzoic acid, carboxylic acids, and various amino acid derivatives. Now, typically we think of phytochemicals in the context of plant foods, but when animals graze, uh, particularly biodiverse pastures, uh, or consume phytochemically rich feed, many of these phytochemicals can be incorporated into the meat and milk of the animal and represents another avenue by which uh, you and I can potentially uh, increase the phytochemical richness of our diet, as well as obtain un potentially unique compounds from forage that you and I would otherwise not consume. So our initial pilot work does suggest that greater plant diversity results in a higher phytonutrient content, but it will be important to study this um, uh, on a wide range of different production systems, all the way from uh, diverse, from very biodiverse forage, to uh, uh, animals that are finished on, on concentrates, so grain fat animals, and anything in between. Uh, 
so that we can potentially uh, start to define the nutrient density of beef and help inform management practices, both uh, in, in the grass fed at, uh, uh, sphere as well as in, in the grain finishing uh, uh, part. Um, and which brings me to the next part, and I'm really grateful that uh, so many uh, producers here uh, are here today, and hopefully also many consumers. Really, uh, where we're going down this road together and using these very novel research techniques that will hopefully also that the goal is to benefit the farmer and inform management practices, as well as in uh, get a good publication out of this that can potentially impact uh, or, or inform. Uh, policy on, on best practices on how to uh, produce meat, not only in a way that is environmentally sustainable uh, or regenerative, but also benefits can potentially benefit human health. Uh, our hypothesis is that practices that are potentially beneficial for the environment will have a trickle down effect and improve uh, the health of the animals and potentially the health of humans. So with this data, we hope to inform management practices also in hope to inform consumers about the potential healthfulness of meat and how do, does the way that we raise animals impact the healthfulness of meat. We also hope that this can improve the sustainability, both environmental and economic, which is also of course very important to note because uh, both are part of, of the sustainability metric. And this is really the bigger picture of, of, of our work and, and the research that, uh, that we uh, hope to do with, with this project as well as other projects. And that is really linking uh, food production practices to uh, nutrient density and population health. Because ultimately uh, it is all related, planetary health, soil health, plant health, animal health, and human health. Uh, because diets ultimately link human environmental health. And we are trying to answer the questions, do agroecological production practices, so production practices that mimic natural ecosystems that are regenerative or environmentally friendly, do they also benefit human health? In other, way, in, in other words, uh, with these grand challenges of feeding 10 billion humans by 2050 and creating a healthy, sustainable and equitable future and implementing farming practices that we can do in 200 years from now and still be sustainable and nourish populations. Now, do these practices that have a potential beneficial impact on uh, the environment also benefit human health? And that is really the bigger picture of, uh, of, of the work that uh, we do as part of uh, our interdisciplinary research group and our systems research. Now, none of the work uh, I do alone, uh, Dr. Provenza, uh, Dr. Fred Provenza spoke earlier, collaborator, also various collaborators at Duke University, Lincoln University, USDA ARS and NC State University that uh, we will all try to work on, on this project or have worked in various ways on some of the uh, pilot work that, uh, that I've presented with, uh, with you here today. Also very grateful for uh, the current uh, uh, research partnerships that we have with the USDA SARE, the Dixon Water Foundation, the Turner Foundation, as well as uh, this project with the, the Bionutrient Food Institute. Um, hopefully by the time uh, uh, we get to the Q&A, my plane will have landed and I will jump on for, for the Q&A in a few minutes and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Stefan. I'm not sure if uh, Stefan is ready to join us yet. Um, probably getting pretty close. So um, before we go to our, our next two guests, oh, there's Stefan. Wonderful. Hi, Stefan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much, Lisa. I just, uh, my plane just landed from, uh, from Texas. So I'm at an airport now, but uh, ready to join and answer any questions later. Oh, thank you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, we just, you, I don't know if you, if you saw, but we, we just played your presentation and um, I would very much like to just give you the opportunity to go ahead and speak a little more to that. And if you want to speak a little bit more about the specifics of designing the study, I know we have probably a lot of people on who are uh, ranchers and producers and farmers and organizations. And I think would love to learn a little bit more about the design of the study. If you'd like to Go ahead and share that as well. Absolutely. So <laughs> what, we'll, what we'll be doing, and, and thanks everyone so much for, uh, for attending the webinar and uh, really appreciate it for, to, uh, to see you all here today and, and see such a great turnout. 
Um, so what we'll be doing as part of uh, the beef nutrient density project, and, and we're going to try to answer the question, do uh, production practices that have a potential uh, beneficial impact on soil health and, and plant diversity and animal health also have a beneficial impact on human health? Now that will be obtained or uh, achieved through linking soil health metrics. And we're gonna ask uh, the farmers to send in soil samples uh, as well as forage samples, as well as meat samples. Now our initial work uh, suggests that when animals graze biodiverse forage, that uh, phytochemicals from the forage get incorporated into their meat and milk. And these are uh, various polyphenols and flavonoids and alkaloids that many of you may heard of in the context of plant foods. You typically hear their, their, about their presence in plant foods. Well, they are also found in animal sourced foods. And what is particularly unique about uh, these compounds in animal source foods is that the animal, the ruminant contains vegetation that you and I cannot consume and providing us with an avenue to upcycle unique compounds that we would otherwise not have access to. So this is a way of further increasing the phytochemical richness of our diet. Uh, we will also be looking at things like, like fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, of course, uh, very important also. Though these have been studied before, we really go beyond just uh, amino acids and fatty acids. So my research team uses a technique called metabolomics. Metabolomics is a, is a technique that is, uh, looks at, as the name would suggest, metabolites. Metabolites are intermediates or end products of metabolism. Now, this could be plant metabolism, animal metabolism, or human metabolism. Now, many of these metabolites found in plant and animal fruits are also what we consider nutrients. And these uh, could be things such as fatty acids, as well as phytochemicals. These nutrients have potent or potential anti-inflammatory and uh, antioxidant effects, uh, but also certain anti-diabetic effects. Uh, in other words, they are generally health promoting. Now, we certainly must do much more human research uh, after we at the beef nutrient density to uh, see what the appreciable felt effect is on human health. But I'm really excited about this project because it will allow us to look at a wide variety of, of production systems, uh, grain fat, grass fat, and, and everything in between, and really see how that may impact uh, the, the healthfulness of, of, of or the nutrient density and the presence of certain fatty acids, amino acids, and phytochemicals that could have uh, potential uh, impacts on, uh, on, on our health. Um, so that is really what we'll be doing in, in this project. Uh, and, uh, and then hopefully in future work, we can really link that directly to human health in, in clinical research trials as well. Uh, and, and by uh, participating with farmers, we can all go uh, down this road together. And that's what I'm excited about because it's really a uh, novel research that uh, anyone who would like to participate would participate in. And we're really innovating together and really trying to make these linkages that we often hear between healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, and healthy humans. Uh, and this is really a first step of, uh, of, of trying to figure out, uh, do certain agroecological or regenerative produ production practices improve uh, the, the nutrient density of beef? And here, and we are uh, not picky, we're interested in both grass fed systems, uh, grain fed systems, uh, because I, I certainly think that, that both will have an, a place in the, in our future food supplies and uh yeah i'm really excited about uh, about uh, working with uh, with you all possibly on this and uh, i'm happy to take uh, any any questions uh, uh in a little bit beautiful thank you thank you for sharing all of that um i'm just going to ask dan really quickly i'm looking at the hour it's at 1 40 and we have a couple more you know a couple more presentations yet and yeah if you have any questions for stefan Please put them in the Q&A. Dan, would, do you have any more that you would like to say about the study in particular? Yeah, well, I would just say that, you know, along with, with everything that Stefan shared, our, you know, our hope is to define the nutrient density of beef. You know, we, we, he sort of said it obliquely, he's focusing more on like which management practices and which environmental conditions and which, you know, fertility feeding strategies affect nutrient density, but we have to define nutrient density before we can say which those things are. So um, yeah, but just to emphasize that the part of the reason why we're looking at all these compounds is so we can 
be in a place to be able to say, this is in the relative 80th percentile, this is in the relative 20th percentile. And until we've got that spectrum of variation properly defined, we can't really feed back that guidance most well to growers and then forward to farm to, to consumers. So yeah, very excited to engage this um, complex, but it, it seems entirely doable endeavor and uh, very grateful for Stefan's partnership and and Fred's you know guidance behind the scenes and everyone else's um, engagement. It's really it's quite it's quite humbling all those who have signed up in the past couple of days to take part in this endeavor. Um, it's 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 very humbling. Beautiful. All right. And uh, so next um, we're going to play uh, a video of uh, somebody who I don't really think needs much introduction with this group. But we had a conversation with Joel Salatin a couple of days ago. Joel was uh, one of the very first people to sign up for this study. And he has some words that he'd like to share with you all today. He wanted to be here, but he had a conflict. So he uh, recorded a video with us the other day. So Chris, if that's ready to roll, I'll let you go ahead and do that. Well, it's great to be with you, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but uh, as someone who's been in the you know, grass-finished beef business for decades, uh, I can tell you that um, if, there's, if there's one thing that creates a tension within our movement, uh, it is the different protocols that people use and even the different terminology that people use for uh, grass-finished beef. And it, it, it's very exciting to actually think about some sort of a measure. I mean, at our farm here at Polyface Farm in Virginia, we'd like to think that we're doing a good job. We actually don't know. Uh, we, I mean, we, we can measure earthworms, we can measure grass production, we can measure, you know, average daily gain. We can, uh, we can taste the meat. You know, does it taste good? Is it, is it palatable? But at the end of the day, uh, we really don't know if we're grazing the grass too short, too long. Uh, what would happen if we had more diversity? What would happen if we, if we planted some some summer annuals, for example, uh, so that the animals maybe didn't go through a bit of a stress in a, in a summer drought situation? Um, we don't know the effect of those kinds of things, and 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 those have been really uh, hard to measure, except in terms of of production pounds. Uh, performance, those kinds of things, but we've not tied those kinds of, of on-farm data points or on-farm protocols to a true nutrient-based uh, food nutrient outcome. And so, of course, I've followed uh, the Bionutrient Association and, and specifically Dan's work since, uh, you know, I was friends with his parents, you know, and still am and, and love the family and have, have really enjoyed watching Dan grow up in this space and take ownership of this uh, of this idea of an empirical uh, a benchmark for for our own microbiome performance if you will you know what what actually feeds us going clear to the end of that of that whole long uh, production um, and, and chain of custody uh, um, trajectory, you know, you know, what's out there at the end of it? Well, what's out there at the end of it is eaters, eaters like, you know, like you and I. And, um, and so to, to actually tie um, our microbiome experience, if you will, our nutrient uh, feeding experience to the actual on-farm protocols, uh, whether it's, whether it's, forage, genetics, uh, hang time, <laughs> all these sorts of things, th those become uh, uh, a big deal. And I think that it would actually help to tease out the things that, you know, different gurus have espoused as, well, this is the real answer. And we've, you know, uh, goodness, I edit the Stockman Grass Farmer magazine. We've been running for, you know, after Alan Nation, uh, my wonderful mentor, uh, passed away. You know, that magazine has been running for decades. Uh, and you think, how can we write 
how can we write any more about this topic? And yet there is indeed uh, way more to write. And, and, um, and so this, this will not eliminate that magazine by any means, but it certainly will help in the discussion of teasing out what truly is the, the necessary and most important, the most salient uh, uh, recipe, if you will, for converting forage into, uh, into human nutrition. And so uh, I'm very excited about the, the data points that, uh, that Dan has selected. I'm excited about the participation of uh, numerous farmers in the project. I'm sure that some of us will be pleasantly surprised. Some of us, as this progresses, will be um, frustratingly uh, uh, surprised, you know, uh, in a depressing way, because we'll find out, oh, we're, you know, we're not doing as, as, as good as we thought in our messaging. Uh, we've, we've a little bit overpromised. Uh, but all of that accountability, you know, if there's one thing that our world needs right now, it is, it is authenticity. Uh, and, and so to actually create uh, authentic messaging within our, you know, within our, our grass-finished beef movement, um, where there probably are as many or more variables than any other product that we can imagine, uh, this is a, a huge issue to tackle. Uh, you know, it'd be a lot easier to tackle radishes at first, but um, I, I really commend um, Bionutrient and Dan for picking perhaps the most nuanced package to unpack to start and so kudos i salute you and i'm i'm uh, just honored and delighted and excited about the possibility and about partnering co and collaborating in this great uh, endeavor thank you joel we're very excited to collaborate with you too and uh, at the end of the session, for those of you who are ranchers and producers and people wanting to get involved, we'll give you some more information on that um, at the end. The next person that we have uh, for you, and there she is. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Lisa. Excited to be here. How are you? It's great to see you. I'm brilliant. Yep. Thanks. You are brilliant. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the light is shining here in Montana. <laughs> Nicole is the director of Integrity Soils. She is an author as well, which is super cool. Her book is called For the Love of Soil, Strategies to Regenerate Our Food Production Systems. She is now also teaching a course called Create, which we just were so happy to share um, through the BFA list. So you guys have maybe seen that. So if you're interested in learning more about that and her work, please, please go to Integrity Soils and, and check that out. That looks really cool. And she's, you can probably hear in her voice, she's a, she's a New Zealander, right? I didn't get that right. Yes. Okay. Good guess. Yeah. <laughs> I know I've made that mistake so many times between Australians and uh, New Zealanders. I'm almost hesitant to like venture a guest <laughs> anymore, but you split your time between North America and Australia and New Zealand, correct? Teaching? Uh, before COVID I did. Yes. Yeah. Or, yeah, no. sure. Big timber these days, Montana. Wonderful. Well, I'm just, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor and let you um, speak to us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor and incredible to see the number of New Zealanders I see on this list. Um, so good morning. Uh, good morning to the Australians too. Good evening to people in Ireland and Europe. Just, uh, yeah, it's exciting to see this conversation taking off. And I think for me, what makes me really passionate about this is, um, you know, the number of times I've been into farmers markets and, you know, you meet people and they talk about, you know, we have this nutrient dense food or, you know, we're doing this with our carbon or we're doing all these things. But when you ask them, oh, cool, have you got some tests for that? Nobody does. And um, what it does is it kind of makes me feel like there's a lack of integrity with what we're saying. You know, we talk about nutrient density, but we don't know how to measure it. And in some ways, we don't even know how to define it. Um, and so we really are seeing a global revolution right now. And it's a very exciting time to be involved in soil health. Um, and so obviously we're gonna see some pretty big companies starting to come into the space. And I'm just gonna read a, a short list um, of some of the, the companies we're seeing. So we're seeing Danone, Pepsi Company, Stonyfield, Cargill, Walmart, Kellogg's, Nestle, Cetopia, 
Whole Foods with Amazon and Google X, New Zealand Merino, McDonald's. Uh, and that's just the beginning of the list of companies that are starting to say, hey, we're involved in regenerative agriculture. Um, and we don't have a definition for regenerative agriculture and we're happy about that. But what it does is it creates some smoke and mirrors. It means we've got companies claiming all sorts of things. Um, and I heard a really good quote uh, from Scott Faber, who talked about the promises these companies are making as a little bit like a kinder surprise. It's all shiny on the outside and you have all these promises and you open it up and no matter what, you're always a little disappointed. And so for me, I think we're seeing consumers be increasingly, um, they have less confidence around the quality of food that we're producing. Um, they don't trust what's starting to be said. You know, is that grass fed? Is it grass finished? Is it uh, natural? Is it organic? Um, and consumers are increasingly like, what does any of this mean? Um, what does it mean about maybe the chemicals in it? What does it mean about quality? Am I going to get a steak that tastes terrible or one that tastes really, really nutritious? And it's probably the world where we get the most confusion, what to eat, you know, is beef bad for you or is spinach really dangerous? Um, so it's some of the most confusing messages that we get. And I think... For me, what, we're, what we are seeing right now is an evolution, and it's an evolution that's required. We're coming out of this chemical soup, um, the 120 years of experimentation upon people, and starting to look at how do we transform these outcomes. And what it takes is authenticity, like um, Joel was talking about, transparency, robustness, trust. Um, and we're talking about a space now where trust is so eroded that how do we actually measure some of this? How do we put our money where our mouth is? Otherwise, we're going to see companies saying whatever they want about anything. Um, so that's in part why I'm here, is I'm excited to see this and start to be able to come in under what we're seeing um, around food quality. You know, we can taste some of these things, but really, what is it that makes, um, yeah, how do, we, how do we really say we are doing what we're doing? And that takes integrity. So yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited about the conversation. All right, beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us. No worries. Um, <laughs> it's really great to have you here, Nicole. Uh, let's see here. All right, Fred and Stefan, if you don't mind turning in your cameras, we're gonna open up the Q&A right now, actually. And I might ask Dan to help me field some questions. I know there's also gonna be um, some questions for Dan as well. And I see we have, you know, like I think about 10, 11 questions in the Q&A, but I think there's also maybe some in the chat. So if you see anything, if you see anything there, Dan, that you think that um, you'd like to um, respond to, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Yeah, I'll just do a couple quick here to okay. short the list. Um, will there be citizen science opportunity with the beef studies? As we have been doing with our, our previous work with, you know, roots and leaves and fruits and grains, um, We've been not only working with growers, but also uh, consumers who wanted to purchase things off the shelf and send them into the lab. And we think that's really important to get as a baseline um, because oftentimes the growers that we're working with are pushing the envelope from a biological perspective. And so we're getting, you know, reports showing relatively high levels of nutrients. And so we need things off the, off the shelf to balance it out. And so absolutely um, you can, uh, sign up to be a partner in the citizen science or consumer sort of realm. Um, that would be basically buying a steak off of your local grocery store shelf and sending it in. Um, so that certainly is an opportunity here. I don't think we've mentioned it yet, but it's probably worth starting to mention that the um, the forum where people can go and sign up or uh, engage or support um, is on the bionutrientinstitute.org slash beef URL. So maybe we can just stick that in the chat, but um, certainly that's, yes, there's an opportunity for people who are not growers, not uh, ranchers, et cetera, to take part in the process. Um, Greg asks, uh, will the study be open to Canadian producers to participate? And yes, uh, we're very excited. It looks like, you know, specifically because we've got a relationship with Stefan at Duke and then future at, at Utah State um, through, through the um, university to university, sort of cut out, um, we, are, we will be able to ship things from Europe or from Africa or from Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're very much looking forward to a global, a global um, set of partners in this process. Um, had a good chat with Savory yesterday through their land to market and um, that 
program and they're very much looking forward to having a bunch of their growers submit. So um, yeah, we're very excited to be able to engage this uh, globally. Um, thus far, we've had to have a lab in the country or at least in the continent to, to do the research, but not, not so here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of logistics to navigate there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> There will be an extra shipping cost for anybody who's who's shipping who's uh, not not from the U.S., but it should be relatively nominal in relation to the overall the overall price. All right, those are the first. Those are the only two that I saw that I thought maybe I could answer quick. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, those you... were the only two. Oh, we're the only two. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Here's a here's the question. I'm just going to start at the top in any no particular order um, from Emily. She this is a question for Stefan and Fred. Do you think that genetics, such as uh, i.e. breed, will also have an impact on nutrient density, or will diet be the overriding factor? I uh, I think Fred can can talk about the, the genetics, but uh, what we're seeing so far is that. Uh, the diet is certainly a very important factor. Uh, we even uh, even see this amongst different breeds of animals. Is that uh, the the short end of it is that with greater biodiversity or greater forage diversity, uh, you're going to end up with wider amounts and a higher uh, variety of, of phytochemicals, and uh, irrespective of of the breed, really. So I'd say diet is a, is an important factor, but it. Uh, it could be that different genetics, different breeds, maybe consume slightly different plants or, or exploit different ecological niches. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will also be some uh, subtle differences and a very interesting area to explore further because I, to my knowledge, that has not been explored to, to any uh, great degree. And it is one of the things we will be documenting is the, is the, is the breed as well as the age um, when people send in their samples. Yeah. Fred, did you want to say anything more about that? I just second what the, what oh, okay. Anna and Stefan said. You know, all those I think are wide open for exploration. One can think about how breed could influence that. Certainly, diet, age of animals, all that is just so uh, so open to to exploring. I think it's going to be. 10 lifetimes of work for Stefan, at least. I'm convinced of that. <laughs> and for Dan, and the, the, it's, it's, it's very valuable, but a huge undertaking, no question about it, with lots of interesting things going to come out of it. Wonderful. That's why we have a whole community of people here, right? <laughs> it takes a village, as they say. Uh, the next question, actually, I will try to answer these in some kind of fashion. Okay, so here's another one for Stefan. Um, many ranchers graze different ecological life zones throughout the year. For example, where we live, you might graze in the mountains in the summer and plains in the winter. Will this study capture this type of diversity of grazing? That's a good yeah, we're, yeah, we're very interested in, uh, in, in studying that and also as part of this. Um, I mean, we don't have nearly the database that we'll hopefully obtain from this study, so we can really start answering that question. But again, uh, I think local solutions and adaptations are, are so important. And uh, but again, an overriding factor here, what we see so far and also from the literature is that no matter how you do it, but if you're able to increase biodiversity on your land or in uh, or have some sort of managed, well managed grazing that works well for you, of course. But if you have uh, good quality management practices, good biodiversity, you're going to end up with a probably a phytochemically rich piece of meat, irrespective of whether this is uh, in uh, Canada uh, or, or North Carolina or maybe even Africa. So, uh, but yeah, that will certainly be uh, mm -hmm. uh, something we hope to explore. But uh, initial data would suggest that uh, that uh, that is an, uh, an an important factor is just uh, the, the biodiversity and, and well managed grazing. I'll just, Nicole, I'll, you might have something to add about that as well. I'll just add Sorry, one bit to pick in first, and that is that yeah, yeah, the way ahead. we're designing it is that you know the the, the you basically get, capture a forage sample before the animal is taken to slaughter. So whatever the animal was eating before slaughter is what we want 
to be submitted along with the feces, along with the soil, along with the, the meat. Um, so if you're going to be slaughtering in the summertime, it would be that, that mountain pasture forage. If you're slaughtering in the, in the wintertime, it would be the, the other, you know, lower, lower land forage. Um, that's, that's how we've designed it thus far. We are not designed it to be able to capture, you know, every two months for the, for the previous 12 months. Uh, we certainly could look into that. And I think it feeds into management decisions about where you do finish and, and what some of that forage might be that you include. But Fred and Stefan, how, how, much, how much lag time is there behind when you're testing this meat to what they've been eating? Because we're seeing some things show up and I'm sure Glenn's talked to you about this, about identifying where it was actually raised or yeah, born. It's, it's not last, in terms of meat, the last, I mean, it's going to be a lifetime of the animal, of course, but especially uh, we're capturing in some of the, our uh, current project, which is a smaller, more focused USDA project, uh, capturing last 90 to 120 days. And that seems to be particularly important. Uh, that's also when uh, muscle, about the, the turnover rate of muscle is about one or 2% per day. So if you look at it from that perspective, about 100 days where the, the muscle or the tissue would have completely turned over. So it seems like those last 100, 90 to 100 days uh, capture the forage in that, uh, that, that window is, uh, is particularly important and it's going to, to an extent, dictate what you find in the meat, but certainly the lifetime of the animal is going to be an, uh, an important factor. And uh, to that, I want to add also is that another reason why I think that is the case or why I know that is the case, because the moment an animal enters a feed yard, and uh, it's put on a, on a total mixed ration on a grain-based diet, you see this decrease in, in these uh, volatile compounds, these phytochemicals uh, at 60 days, at 90 days, 120 days. So you do see that, uh, that decrease too, uh, which suggests to me that uh, what the animals fed in the last uh, uh, 90 days or so is going to be a, a big factor of what uh, we find in the meat in terms of these metabolites. Here's another interesting question. Is there any difference in nutritional value between native and improved pastures or annual and perennials? I think this is something that you've kind of sussed out a little bit in your research, uh, Stefan, already that I found particularly fascinating. And maybe you've spoken to this a little bit already, but we have a question here about it. Oh, maybe Stefan's gone. I think Fred No, I'm, 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 st <laughs> I'm still here, but uh, Fred can take that too. He'll uh, have a lifetime experience uh, about that. Sure. Okay. Sure. I, I would, yes, there are going to be differences. Um, the pasture species have been selected primarily for primary compounds and against secondary compounds. In many cases, they've upped the for instance, the nitrogen concentrations to points that are really more than what animals uh, can, can deal with well. So as you move away from pasture species, to this, the cultivated pasture species toward native rangelands, you're gonna get much more phytochemical richness and diversity in those plant species than you will in simple mixtures of, of pasture, agronomic pasture species. So I think it will make a, a big difference. Going back to earlier questions, one of the challenges I see uh, that's gonna be really worthwhile, say a person sends in some, a forage, a quote forage sample. Um, you know, imagine an animal's foraging on rangelands and it's eating uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 species. That's, I'm not saying that to throw cold water on anything, but that's going to be nuance that's going to flavor meat in really important ways. And how we capture that, Stefan and I, you know, we've been already scheming about that quite a lot, but that's, that's going to be nuance that probably matters when it comes to flavor of, of meat, flavor and, and nutrient density, phytochemical richness of the, phytochemical and biochemical richness of the meat. And two, Fred, that would relate to the microbiological activity as well. So soil health is going to tie in with that. Like what are the secondary metabolites from that? And the enzymes from diverse microbiology, as opposed to pastures, maybe that, you know, people think we're grass fed, so therefore we're nutrient dense. And it's like, if your microbial community underground is compromised, how does that affect? I mean, this is, this is what I'm so excited about is that linkage between underground to the animals, to humans is mind blowing. 
Yes, yeah, so it's it's going to be amazing research. I, I think it's so valuable. And anything I'm saying on the complexity isn't to throw cold water, but when you work with it for, for a lifetime and you see all this diversity in animals, utilizing all that diversity and then realizing what's going on below ground, above ground, it's kind of the whole ball of wax and the whole complexity of it, right? And uh, and we know all that is does influence the flavor of, of meat and undoubtedly the uh, phytochemical and biochemical richness as Dan and Stefan have been saying, I think. Uh, yeah, and it gives the terroir then, huh? That they talk about. When that's what they call it, they call terroir. You know, or yeah. Italy, I was on a <laughs> thing this morning with slow food in Italy and they recognized the, the landscape is giving a signature to that and every landscape is different. And maybe like this morning, I prefer Michel's to Gascon's or whatever, but you know, it it gets really, it gets life, huh? It's it's in an in amazingly good, wet, good way. And, and I'm just so, so I'm not meaning to, to throw even the slightest bit of cold water on it. I'm for 250,000%. It's just, I think that it's that kind of complexity though, that's going to be amazing. And, and hopefully it comes out of the work, that nuance, that nuance that really is the terroir then below ground, above ground. And, and maybe no one place is, you know, maybe one, no one place is necessarily quote better than another place as we come down to it, they're different. Uh, and they, they impart different kind of richness and so forth and so on. I think hopefully all that'll come out of, of the work over time. I, I, I'm sure it will with such good group uh, working on this. I some parallels to uh, like the, the French literature on cheese that uh, uh, different, you know, there's different types of cheeses with different types of flavors, right? Depending on uh, on on how it's raised and where it's raised, uh, different mountain pastures, because it's coming out of the Pyrenees, coming out of the Alps, does it come out of an area? All these can be very tasty and, and are very phytochemically rich because these phytochemicals are flavor compounds, but they also be different. Uh, so, and I suspect if that literature is any indicator, um, that we see that in the in the me too and uh yeah that, that will be something that i think that's different that difference is also something we should embrace and, and can actually use to uh to the advantage of uh, of the producer to uh uh create these flavor profiles much like uh the cheeses in france yeah and, and there's a the new zealand with provenance lamb where they are already doing this so showing and you, i don't know if you're working with shortland station so to show the provenance of the terroir that's coming through in their lamb so, you know, some, some, this is already happening around the world. I think it's, it's really exciting. Uh, I sometimes jokingly call is that we're marinating the meat from the inside out. <laughs> I see a comment there. I fed mint, mint silage for a couple of winters and joked it was pre-flavored. There's some truth to that. When I used to hunt grouse in the fall of the year, early in the year when they were eating lots of different fruits and berries, they had one really beautiful, distinct flavor. When they moved into the conifer trees and the terpenes in their diet get into the, into the meat and the fat, there's a hint of terpene. And so, you know, those flavors, absolutely. And if you're a hunter, you realize that, you know, that where the animals are, what they're eating is imparting a, a unique richness to the flavor of the meat. But all of this is, we're talking about the nuances of the people who are managing the land and the animals well. And I mean, to me, that's one of the foundational objectives here is to be able to establish some sort of a differentiation um, where we can empirically say, whether it's this compound or that compound or this compound or that compound, the relative level of them is much higher in this piece of beef than it is in that piece of beef. So. I'm not saying, you know, I don't think nutrient density is going to be, there has to be, you know, so many of this, of this terpenoid and so much of that alkaloid, but it's probably going to be levels and ratios of these families of compounds in relationship to other things. Yeah. And I, I think if we can begin to characterize the levels and ratios as they exist with, from the straight, you know, a corn fed to, you know, whatever high mountain pasture um, it is, then we don't need to define this all so specifically. We can just say, you know, this piece is sitting in this continuum, spot in the continuum, this piece of beef is sitting in that spot in the continuum. Um, getting past the labels, you know, we've talked about polycultures and, and many different species of plants, but there's all kinds of labeling out there right now, which is, you know, grass-fed or pasture-raised. 
And, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a bit of a black box for consumers to understand that, you know, some cows may be sitting in a feedlot being fed alfalfa pellets and can then be formally, you know, labeled as, as grass fed when really it's, it's not going to be providing that level of complexity and nuance in a nutritional standpoint, much less the quality of life for the animal, as Fred was saying initially. So, um, yeah, all very exciting. Um, we've got our hypotheses and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, what's, what's the minimum viable product of a definition of nutrient density versus the complete nuance? I don't think we should ever presume to try to get the complete nuance, but, but um, at least characterizing the space uh, is what I'm so excited about doing with this endeavor. Yeah. Part of that nuance also is the microbiome of the human, right? That's the part of me that's quite fascinating. It's like, as a mom, very simply, I tell my kids, it's like, if you're craving sugar, it's not really you that's craving sugar, it's your microbes that are craving the sugar, right? Or whatever it is. So I, that's the piece that I find really fascinating as well, especially as we're talking about flavor and secondary metabolites and all of these fascinating things and to and all that, right? So I, I'm seeing some questions about um, microbiome as well here. There's a lot of really great questions here. Um, please share your hypotheses this will have for consumers and human health. That's our the, most question. Yes, that's, that's, the, that's the question. Okay, so the hypothesis is, is that uh, greater biodiversity on pasture will concentrate more uh, metabolites with potentially anti-inflammatory and anti antioxidant effects. Uh, that's we're improving the health of the animal. This will have a trickle down effect to the meat. The meat will uh, concentrate more of these components, right? And then this is going to be the, the hypothesis is that when humans consume such phytochemically rich meat, that they will have an antioxidant or anti-inflammatory response after eating that meat. And then over time, of course, if you were to do that for months or years or a lifetime, you would presumably or perhaps re reduce your risk of chronic metabolic diseases such as uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, obesity. But that is very much an open-ended question. So I, uh, that is the hypothesis, but I don't know if it's, if it's correct. Yes, because we need to do, we really need to do also human nutrition work, which is uh, something that uh, our group will be doing over the next few years too and looking to further expand on. Uh, but that's, that's one of the main questions is, is then after we define these density or do it in parallel, that can be done too. Really then look at what is the effect on human health? Because mm -hmm. IPOP, that on paper will definitely look at it. That's what our, our, our pilot data suggests and, and the literature suggests. Um, but we also have to look at will that translate to, uh, to health to benefit. We had presenters earlier at this conference, um, Pierre Biel from France, who's established this certification label called Blue Blanc Cour, which is all about certain nutritional levels and ratios in animal products that did do some, some very good human trials um, that showed <laughs> these, exact, these exact things. So it does seem like the literature does support this concept that, that you know, when your animal products are, are, are from healthy animals, if you're eating them, um, they can have very positive effects on inflammation markers, which is the foundation of all chronic illness, as I understand it. So um, that's not saying you have to eat animal products, but um, I think the, the, the concept of secondary metabolites applies just as well to plants as it does to animal products, you know, lettuce and, you know, oats and, and carrots. Um, as this biochemical complexity applies across the board. I will just say that one of the reasons that we chose beef to start with, I think was one of the questions here, why, why have we chosen beef? Um, you know, we, we have spent four years looking at uh, 21 different uh, roots and leaves and fruits and grains um, without a complete sort of uh, biochemical analysis. We have not had the money to do the metabolomic analysis. And so we did primarily elemental analysis with just a couple of compounds. Um, so it's not like we're starting with beef out of the gate. We certainly have done a lot of, a lot of plant assessment, um, but as far as the strategic role of, of you know, four-leggeds in the environment, um, you know, it's, my, it's my understanding that you know, if we're looking not only at the, at the market, which, for which beef is a massive global market, 
And so, you know, there's a significant economic leverage point there, but for the, the landscape and the way that, you know, appropriate management of the landscape through agriculture, through uh, pasture can have some very powerful um, environmental effects, very positive environmental effects as well. I think there's a really good argument to focus on beef there. So not only is it a large, is it a large market globally, um, just as a, as a commodity, um, the opportunities to inspire different management practices of the ways cows are, are treated um, could have some very powerful environmental impacts. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of growers uh, of various scales um, who are very interested in um, being able to differentiate themselves from the market. And so that's really who I hope, uh, at least to some subset of the attendees here are, and the ones who, who signed up are those growers um, who say, look, I think I'm doing a pretty good job and I'd like to be able to understand where I sit in that continuum um, and be able to market that to my customers. If we can establish a baseline of what's on the shelf and then we can say, you know, you as a farmer, because you own your data, we, we don't, I, mean, I never have access to who you are. That's all entirely anonymized. But if you say, look, here, these are my results and they make it look like my stuff is five times more nutritious than the, than the stuff on the shelf, um, that's your prerogative to go out there and market it. But we certainly hope that we can provide that knowledge to these growers who are operating on scale, who do have the potential to have significant ecological benefit uh, effects um, supported in this endeavor. Um, and then transition accordingly. You know, the idea is through transparency, through, through economic incentive, um, the market is inspired to focus more on what the consumers are looking for. Um, so anyway, that just was a, a bit of an answer to one of the questions I saw here coming through. Uh, Since you're on that know, topic, Dan, there's been a number of questions about the bionutrient meter. Would you like to address how a little bit about that and if some of these studies will be applicable to the meter at all? Sure. Um, yeah, I was just looking at Fiona's question here about EOV. And we did talk to Saver yesterday and Land to Market and very, very interested about integrating into EOV. Of course, EOV is also one of those things where the, where the growers own all their data. And so we're not gonna make any presumptions about having access to it, but, but establishing those, those overlapping data sets is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the spectrometer, I think I saw one of the questions earlier, is it available? Uh, the one we have now is available. Um, I think if you go to bionutrient.org, um, then you can find it there under bionutrient meter. Um, it is a, as I have kept trying to say, a Apple II. It is not a Macintosh. It is not an iPhone. It is a first generation, you know, consumer spectrometer. It does work. We have basic calibrations for 10 crops. Um, presumably, we will be able to have basic calibrations for beef. After this work is done, we don't know that, um, but we are simultaneously working to improve the the foundational hardware. So, I mean, the meter we've got right now is a, is a basic first generation one, and so there's going to be an evolution of that infrastructure, that 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 instrumentation over time, um, and so we welcome you know those who want to engage in this space are you know from the BFA's position, um, it's really important that the data around which definitions of quality get made is kept open. That is not the kind of thing that is able to be black boxed or controlled. Um, my personal background in the organic movement, you know, watching the certification systems, which were well-intentioned, get effectively taken over by the government and then by industry, I think is a, is a, is a cautionary tale. Um, and so our hope is that nutrient density is, a, um, is an evolving, um, improving hopefully, but it, a foundationally open empirical standard um, and it's it's results based not not process based absolutely that's another question that may go along with that um, is someone is asking how long it will be before some of this data is available to share with farmers and consumers I think Stefan can I, if I can quote you on that um, we had written up the uh, <laughs> in the proposal uh, one to three months. We thought, you know, from when you send things in to when we'll be able to get them out. We had written that up that, and uh, Stefan said, no, 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 don't don't do that. Um, <laughs> people are waiting for ten years to get this information, and if we promise it to them in one month and they get it in three, they're going to be unhappy with us. 
so let's tell them three to six months. And then when they get it in three, they'll be totally happy. So I think, I believe we updated the, the PDF. It's again on that link, uh, biotechinstitute.org slash beef. Um, you can download and read the details of what the compounds are that we'll be assessing, what the microbial species are, we'll be able to assess in, your, in the, in the, in the um, feces, uh, the minerals we're looking at, the, you know, the elements we're looking at in the, in the soil and the, and the, and the fodder. Um, but I think we said three to six months is when, um, from when you submit the sample to when you'll get the results. And as with our other work, the concept is that you get your results in context with everyone else's. So you can see where your, where your you know, numbers are in relation to everyone else who's taken part in this process. No one else can see your numbers, only you can. I mean, only, you're the only person who knows those numbers are yours, but everybody's data is in the pool. And so you can see where you stand and you can see well, this other farmer did this, or they used this genetic, and so that you can modulate and you can ex experiment. Um, but yeah, we're saying three to six months. Yeah, and I, I do want to highlight indeed that we will grow the database over time, so we'll get a better feel for it uh, over time. And another important point to notice, and that's why I, I told them, let's that's, that's, uh, be conservative, because you're, you are all, anyone who would uh, contribute to that would really be, we're really working on, on novel research here. So we're really, uh, 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 innovating and, and learning and developing as we go. So that's almost important to note is that uh, we're really, you are really contributing to, uh, to, to novel research on this topic. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's also important to, to note. All right. We have about eight minutes left. And if anyone has anything they would like to offer, I would like to that you feel like wasn't talked about today. That's, um, that's important. I would like to just open it up for you to do that. And then I think we'll just wrap it up with giving people an opportunity to know um, how they can support and get involved if they are feeling like they wanna do that. So if anyone has anything else they'd like to, to, to bring forward into this discussion, it's really, I, I, I wish we could talk for longer, actually, because we have, this is such a fascinating topic and, you know, so many, in so many ways, we'll have to host another session, maybe similar, to talk about microbiome and secondary metabolites and terroir and all those really exciting things. Can't help but put this out. You, you've mentioned the microbiome several times, Lisa, and it's an important point. Years ago, probably in the early 70s, people were looking at the microbiomes of ruminants, cattle, sheep, and goats, and, and wild animals as a function of the diversity of their diets. And as you would expect, the more, the greater the number of plant species and phytochemical richness, the more diverse and robust the microbiome was, leading to greater health for, for the animals themselves. So that's that was studied before humans ever thought about studying the microbiome. Ruminant nutritionists were way into that 50, 60 years ago. And that was one of the key findings is that the more diverse the diets of the animals, the more diverse the microbiome, as we'd expect huh, from, from human studies. Somebody brought up a, a comment about uh, Albrecht and how he studied World War II soldiers based upon what, what they ate and how that affected their health um, upon where they were stationed. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. I figured you and, and Dan, I see Dan smiling there because he, he reads a lot of Albrecht. I used to steal his Albrecht books. <laughs> if anyone else has anything that they'd like to offer in our last few minutes, I'd like to just open up the floor. I don't see, Nicole, you wanna go? Well, one aspect I think is really interesting is if we can start to look for stress markers and cortisol levels, or if, has that animal been in flight and fight for a long time, then perhaps that helps some people who have concerns about humane animal treatment, that that could be something that is an additional marketing tool is, you know, we're using low stress animal handling, um, you know, that whole process is, is, is pretty quick. I mean, I think that's some of the concerns of people that have been turned off meat. And I see people doing a brilliant job with raising their animals. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. yeah, I'd add to that as well that there's a nice literature that's developing. It's not enormous, but around the diets of animals and monotony versus diversity. I just reviewed paper out of New Zealand, actually a thesis, 
And the more restricted the diet, the higher the stress levels are on animals. So when you speak about cortisol levels, diversity leads to less stress, less cribbing, less weird kind of behaviors and healthier animals. So all that's, all that's winding around to make this story about plant diversity and its importance as links in with animal welfare, as links in with soil health, as links in with greenhouse gas emissions, all that starting to put a really broad spin on this story. And then Dan, going back to your point, you know, well, what does that mean in terms of how an animal is produced? And you can have many different people producing in many different environments, but you can have common themes related to, to the health of, of uh, the environment and the animals and, and so forth. Beautiful. Well, I'm just looking at the number of questions that we've got unanswered and all of the chats that have been happening here <laughs> and, and thinking about, you know, our, our objective here is to, you know, at least share to the community the intentions of this endeavor and to, you know, hopefully inspire some people to engage. Um, um, I think our, this is being recorded. We will make it publicly available. Um, I do believe all the chats, et cetera, will be there, uh, the, the Q&A. Um, I'm thinking about uh, perhaps, you know, taking the questions that had not been answered and, and typing up answers and sending that along to people. Our, our objective is to engage a collaborative framework. Um, so we, you know, are an educational organization. We're not a company. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to bring forth you know, collaboration around this nutrient density topic. Um, so I'll just say again, you know, for those who are interested in, in engaging, whether being a, a grower partner or a citizen scientist or a, an organizational partner, or just maybe you want to donate to support the endeavor, um, I think we have all those opportunities on the biodutrientinstitute.org slash beef URL. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, this this a recorded copy of this is a, will be available. Um, I think we're planning on sending it around to everyone who has uh, attended. Um, but this is, as we said earlier, the the final presentation um, of a of a conference that's been going on for eight months. It started in February. It's called the Soil and Nutrition Conference. Um, we've had a number of uh, very. Um, I'm you know I'm always I'm always honored by the by those who who are willing to speak at our conference. Um, but all those recordings are publicly available um, on our YouTube channel uh, as well on the soil and nutrition um, org website. So um, those yes. who are who are new to the community, we welcome you. Those who are longtime allies, thank you for your for your uh, allyship, and we're really looking forward to to doing this um, nutrient density with beef thing. You know, quite systemically. This is not. Yeah, Fred, you said this is a couple of lifetimes of work, but we're trying to get this done so we can move on to milk is short on the, on the list next and then grains and then we'll go back to vegetables. I don't, I want to do this for all kinds of food. I don't want to do it just for, just for meat. Um, okay. um, so yeah, the, the uh, appetite is still large. <laughs> milk and eggs are uh, our two future avenues that we can easily move into. Yeah, exactly. No, and I think it's good for good for good for good for you. <laughs> you know, that's the way. Young and full of energy, and I gotta go for it. Absolutely. I'm with you. Great. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. All of you online whose faces we cannot see, we thank you so much um, for being here. And we'll be sending out an email to all of you who registered. Um, so to let you know how you can plug in and the recording will be available very soon, probably in the next day or two. And I just, yeah, thank you all. Thank you for, to Nicole and Dan and Fred and Stefan. Thank you all for your amazing work in the world to help us all be healthier and help us uh, heal the planet. Great. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. <laughs> be well all. Thank you. Take care everyone. Have a great day.